Fiona Oates. I'm primarily an animal carer. I do marathon running as well. Um, for those of you who've heard my talk before, uh, I'm sorry if it's getting to sound a bit repetitive, um, but uh, I haven't prepared anything this time because I just haven't got time. I haven't had time. Um, I've just returned from Antarctica, um, where I managed to break for the animals uh, two world records and set a third for being the fastest woman to ever run a marathon on every continent and the North Pole in Denmark. <laughs> When I started the challenge, I didn't think it was going to be possible in the time I had to run quick marathons, but um, as time went on, I managed to find the strength to um, break that record by uh, over three hours, I think. So, um, as I say, I broke two records and I uh, set third, and I also managed to win the race at the, in the Antarctic, just as I did in the North Pole, and break the course record to finish on there. So. Um, I, I, I don't consider myself a great marathon runner or an expert or a great athlete. Um, people have asked me, what is the secret to my success? Um, it's the belief in why I do it. I don't do it for me. I don't like running and it certainly wouldn't be what I would choose to be doing every morning and every night and every Sunday. Um, and what keeps me going is my love and belief that it's possibly encouraging other people to consider a more compassionate lifestyle. Um, I did become, I've run Sanctuary now, we've had Tower Hill Stables Animal Sanctuary for over 17 years and the animals that I care for there and the animals that I care for in Russia are safe. Um, even, you know, obviously as long as we live they're safe and we have to make provision for them after we die. Um, so those animals are safe but they are only 400 animals, random animals picked from wherever. Um, I'm more concerned about the ones that I can't help physically, and that's why I um, chose to uh, kind of was pushed into doing this challenge, um, globally going to every continent and um, running a marathon. Which, uh, quite frankly, looking back on it, I think how was I was so stupid to ever think I would take that on and do it. But I managed to do it, and I, um, I got home early hours of Sunday morning last week. Um, but unfortunately we were delayed in Antarctica for a week, the weather was so bad there we couldn't get out of Antarctica and that's what made me very, very late so I had to get back home and take over looking after the animals at the sanctuary pretty immediately. So um, it's all been a bit of a roller coaster and really, really hectic and... Um, Do you run the animals? Pardon? Do you run the animals charity? Well, I run my own animal sanctuary, yeah. we've got 400 rescue animals. Uh, high level and I come from a really really sports 
orientated background to cycling. And the whole point of me continuing to do the sport is to produce, provide the longevity that I, I can actually produce. I mean, I ran 11, in 11 weeks, I ran five marathons on five different continents, all in London Marathon Championship qualifying time. Um, and then I came and I ran a marathon at the highest altitude ever that a marathon has ever been run. That's like running a marathon halfway up Mount Everest. And then I came down from that five days later, I went to Antarctica and I broke the course record for the fastest woman to ever run a race in Antarctica. And I'm doing that to, and hey, I will, I, after everybody, nobody actually did the Atacama race and the Antarctic race. The one guy from Al Jazeera TV was hoping to do the both and film it. And when he, when he got to 25k in the Atacama, he said, this is just not funny. This is just ridiculous trying to do this. And when he got to 30k, he said, I'm not doing it because if I do it, I will not be able to go to Antarctica. And the television crews, the camera crews, the race organiser, they were all on their knees. I mean, literally, they were literally in a bad way after being at altitude for that length of time. To then consider going and running another one in really, really cold weather conditions, after, after the race, I was the one that then took on the challenge of helping another competitor who wanted to do the 100k race get around that, and I actually went around and did half of that with him. And I was the fittest one there. I'm, I'm kind of the one that's bouncing around and saying, I can do this, that, the other. They were all laying in the beds in Punta Arenas going, I never want to walk again. And they haven't even run the race. And that's been my whole point. Yeah, well, what is the secret to this? Because, you know, you've got to bear in mind, I've been to every continent and I've been to the North Pole. Another instance is, what's jet lag? Because I've never had it. I've literally come home and I've got straight on with the jobs. Oh, oh. Can we do um, questions at the end? Yeah, well, okay. Yeah. Um, I've never actually personally stopped and... Well, actually, no, I have. Yeah, in the Alcantara Desert. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll try. Uh, yeah, I would. Yeah, I dare say it is. And every, everybody does races differently. I mean, it's like asking Paula Radcliffe if, if she's ever stopped. I'm not urging that because it just kind of does that. It's done no good to my body, but I run some dead hard times. Yeah, who's here to talk about running? Yeah, I'm going to talk about running. Can we hear us? Anyway, anyway. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm going to talk about running. Anyway, back to the Antarctic. Let's go back to the Antarctic. How many of you have been in town? The person who's talking about walking and that. The longer you are out there, it does take a toll on your body. I mean, I've travelled with you on that. We've talked about this for hour after hour after hour. And we are convinced that the vegan diet and preparation and discipline and knowing your own body is the way to get down, isn't it? Taken out the food chain 
But as I say, it's not enough for me to just think, oh, well, look at me, I've, I've got this same tree and I'm to have perfect, because it's not helping the animals out there that um, are, um, have got no voice. And just, I mean, okay, it was hard, and I'm going to say it was really, really hard. And towards the end of the Antarctic races, I was getting very, very tired. But I mean, people say, oh, it must be, you know, you've got to pull out if, you, if you're suffering. But what is a few days of suffering? And let's be right, I could pull out at any time and say, no, I've had enough to the amount of suffering that's going around, around in the world every minute, every day. So that's what kept me going. Everybody's got different agendas of why they do things. I know why I do it. Um, I hope it helps. Um, I hope I'm a role model. And I hope, I know when I've been to countries like, I went to Siberia, around the age of of my um, marathon in Oms, and the amount of positive feedback I got from people coming over to me who were vegetarian, who were vegan even, in Russia, and they say it's so, so difficult, and their family and uh, discriminate against them, their friends think, oh no, you're going to be ill, they think you're going to be anemic, they think you're going to die, and they said it means so much to have somebody actually come to our country and do it. I mean, you can fire at them, you know, Carl Lewis and, um, I don't know, Beyond saying that she's gone vegan for 22 days all the time, but it makes no difference to people who actually live here in Oms or in Siberia. Seeing you do what you did in this race has made a difference. And it's also helped me, every country I've been to, I've tried to incorporate it with going to an organisation or going to the American Vegan Society or going to Friend Dog Rescue in Oms. When I went out, I was only in Oms for two days and I got a phone call to the hotel saying, would you be able to come out to our, our dog shelter, see the work we do and perhaps even, I don't know, get some publicity for it via the fact that you're on the elite start of this big marathon. And I went out there and I spent all Friday out there with these ladies who did wonderful work. And it made, what made that race really special for me is that the press conference the next day, when I was amongst the kind of on a row of like African, Ethiopian, Eritrean, and Fiona sitting there with Percy, people were saying to me, why are you here to do it? Obviously they were here to win and make money. And I was here, you know, I was able to hear say, promoting veganism, was able to help Tatiana who works at Friend Dog Rescue. And that got that all over the press, not just in Russia, in Omsk, in Siberia, but all over the press in Russia. And that's what <coughs> means a lot to me. That's what I did this for, not just to be, hey, look at me, I've got two world records, I'm fantastic, because quite frankly, I'm not. I'm not that great. Um, but uh, I just hope that uh, it's made a difference somewhere along the line by, by doing what I've done. Um, I don't know if people want to ask me about my running, my training, uh, what aspect they're interested in, whether they're interested in the sanctuary or, or what. Um, I've written a book. I've written a book. Uh, no, <laughs> I have written a book. Now, I, I'd like to write a book. A lot of people, it's really, really difficult. This, this is an issue I'd really like to say to people. A lot of people. And I, obviously, at these races, I've mixed with a lot of varying kinds of people from all over. Everybody I've met has said you should write a book about what you've done. Um, but I can't get anybody interested in the press, the media, nobody's interested. When I started to do this, it was kind of, oh, go away and come back when you've done it. So I had to scurry off and dig deep and do all this. I've come back when I've done it, and it's like, hmm. I'm not sure, you know, there's an angle there. And I have found, as I've gone on, the one thing that kills the story dead is the vegan issue. I've said it before, when I went on the BBC, um, on the breakfast programme, I was told categorically, before you come on here, you do not talk about veganism. It's a no-go. And if you look at that interview, the only way I was able to mention it is when they still said, right, here you are, Fiona, isn't it lovely? You've got your little teddy with you, you know. Why did you do the race? And then the only way I could get the vegan thing is, well, I'm a patron of the Vegan Society, which is their 70th anniversary next year, so I did it to promote it. That is the only way they would let me mention the word vegan, and it has gone on and on and on. I had problems um, with the North Pole, the organisers of the North and the Antarctic Marathon, because they felt that their race, by me winning a course record and coming so high with the men's race, had caused a problem in that the, the race was being too much attached to veganism, and they didn't want that. They didn't want to think it's a vegan race. It's just a race and a vegan happened to win it. And they got very, very fully over it. I didn't have a very nice time in Antarctica. I won't share the story with you now. It was I was pretty much blacklisted. I, I, my diet was made a very difficult issue at camp. Um, and I've realised now that whatever people say, um, it isn't popular and they don't want to sell it en masse. And I know you get people who are famous like, you know, Jay-Z's gone vegan for 22 days. Well, quite frankly, they'd print anything, print it if Jay-Z, I don't know, ate a banana, they print news. It's just the 
celebrity issue they're interested in. They're not interested in the ethical and the reasons. And I've tried to analyse it, and I've looked at adverts on television, etc., for this time of year, and it's all about Asda, meat retailer of the year. They want to sell these products. This, this is where the mass money is, and they don't want some. They don't want to know about somebody who does all this on a, on a meat free diet. They don't want that because there's too much money involved in it. And as for people, I mean, I thought, well, Bill Clinton's gone vegan, and he's promoted it, uh, the World Health Authority to encourage veganism for children to tackle child obesity in America. And I'm thinking, you know, there is an issue that there are an awful lot of obesity-related conditions. That if you, say if you're a vegan and you go into a supermarket, a lot of aisles with bad products on, you could avoid kind of thing. Um, and um, but they don't seem interested because if people do get medical conditions or become unhealthy, <laughs> then the pharmaceutical industry is just rubbing their hands together as well. Certainly no fair side like this. 
So we basically felt the way I was going to live. And that's what seems to be all my life. And it does carry me through. I mean, obviously, I'm doing like the most arduous things you could possibly imagine doing. And I'm, you know, fine. I don't, I don't think I suffer with anything. So, you know, but everybody's different. And I think you've got to work out what suits you. Um, because, you know, what, you know, people have got all sorts of allergies, all sorts of. Well, you've got to be sensible, obviously. You can't just walk around saying, no, I'm going to eat it. I mean, you've got to be sensible. But obviously, you know, I've been doing it for like 30 odd years here, so, so it's working for me. Um, you said you were sent Russia, so yeah. Yeah, well, uh, funny enough, I was in Russia in about 2000. Mm -hmm. And um, when I got there, I was quite shocked at the amount of stray dogs, cats on the streets. But long story, we actually rescued a dog in Red Square. And I, I met, obviously, they've tidied the tidy dog lot now, but in 2000, there were little dogs and cats in Russia. Oh, it's awful. And I went out of the store with um, an interpreter who was actually and everybody was getting the bus going around some thousands of people or whatever and I was sitting there back and, mmm, and I see this little dog and I told her about it and she said look when we get back from this tour we'll go back into Red Square and we'll see if we can find this dog that I've been told to put down and we've got right really trouble like our ladies too and we went back and we found him and she said look I, I got, I got on the marathon the next day and got home the following day I will take the home for you and I will look after him and after that when we got home, obviously I kept in touch with Spectre and the dog boys. And after that, um, I thought, well, what more can we do in Russia? Animal rights, animal welfare. And I rode around for about a year to try and find someone who might know someone and do something. All the big old guys and said, don't even think about going into Russia, it's too cool. You send money, it won't get there. And I must admit, even when we sent money by banks, it got pilfered off, they weren't getting it. It was really cool. In the end, I uh, was put in touch with a fantastic girl called Elena Sorokina who worked at Greenpeace. And she said, yes, I'd really like to start helping. We could, we could sort something out. So together, we started rescuing stray dogs and cats. It was basically done in a very primitive way to start with, in that if there was any rescue done in Russia, it was basically elderly ladies who found cats and dogs on the street, took them back to their apartments and tried to look after them. So we started off by helping a lady called Elena Lanshkova, and they were in the site saver, who were just doing that. Then as things got a little bit easier, a little bit more affluent in Russia, um, a little group started called Dita Animal Rights Animal Awareness and through that we decided we were going to start bull fighting in Moscow, which we did, but it was a very, very sad story. The people who tried to fight the bulls allowed them to die systematically, they starved them, they charged us a lot of money to buy the two remaining ones and when they actually they insisted on delivering them to the safe place we got them to go and when they arrived there at the back of the lorry they broke both the necks in transit on purpose. So it is that kind of thing, very, very difficult to, to do anything proactive for animals in Russia. I understand it in a way because what people were saying is we haven't got food ourselves, so why, why the animals can Why help animals we don't have food ourselves? Um, but since then it's got better and we've got a little place outside Moscow running friends after. We've got horses, we've got tigers, bears, animal cats and dogs. We do it very informally. We haven't opened it as a place where people can go because even in this country, people say to me, Oh, we've tried to deliver a package to you for two hours and we haven't got a sign at the end you can drive. And I've had to say, No, we haven't got a sign down there because, believe you me, mm -hmm. if we had a sign down there, we would be queuing up the drive with animals that mm -hmm. have been brought to us. I mean, the little cat that came on Tuesday morning with a broken jaw and a broken leg, I've had dogs tied outside. I've gone to the gate expecting a package and come back with a pony. You know, literally, literally, I've opened the gate and it's been, you know, hello, I got that, will you reown my pony? And I'm there going to the, um, how, that, how big is it? What, where is it? And what's your time scale? And you just said, look here, it's the end of the drive. If you don't take it now, it's going to the sold for us. And that like that. Um, you know, so you, if you advertise, you'll get a, a lot of kind of that sort of thing in this country, but in Russia, what we're frightened of is if we advertise the sanctuary, you might get a lot of vindictive people who come along and then do bad things for the animals. So that's why we don't. But that, that's basically how the sanctuary started in Russia. Just to uh, been somewhere and I, I couldn't just kind of go and come away and give it all. Good. And I'll keep in touch and I'd love to help. I'm not that sort of person. I, I, it preyed on my mind and I thought, I'm not going to let this drop. I really do want to do something out there and, and get this little group together that it's so tiny a fraction of people in Russia that think about animal rights that uh, they decided very much to focus on children. Going into schools and talking to children about the situation, encouraging vegetarianism, veganism, role models and stuff like that, and that's how they work. So, that's essential. Sorry. <laughs> After your accomplishments, what's next? Well, I've got a few things. Um, I've got a few things. Um, I've got a few things. 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 I've got a few
right, well, this, is, this has come to me in a brain. <laughs> Net, well, I'm very fortunate in that um, the clothing for the uh, North Pole Marathon and the Antarctic Marathon was very expensive. This is going somewhere. And I was sponsored by uh, the people who make this clothing, specialist clothing called UVU. And uh, they gave me a full set of gear to run in, which was fantastic, fantastic stuff. But since I did so well in the races, they've asked me to race next year in the Marathon Style again, which I was going to do, um, but for Team UVU, who are also sponsoring the uh, probably winner of the race, that will be Mohamed Amsterdam, um, and so racing on his team. <laughs> so that'll be very good here. But um, so that finishes, and the next day is the London Marathon. So what I'm hoping to do is finish the Marathon Salve in a good place, get on a plane, come home, go on the start line of the London Marathon in a cow suit. <laughs> so I'll be on the elite star of the London Marathon, panning down. There's no reason I can't do it. I can wear what I like as long as I've got an affiliated club vest on, a number, and vegan runner top on. Uh, top on. So there's no reason that I can't do that. So basically, when they're scanning down the competitors, and you know, this is so and so from Africa, or you know, then it'll be we have cow. <laughs> um, and as for that, that might, because I won't be looking to obviously run well in the London Marathon coming out of the desert, <coughs> but I thought it might just be that. You know, for the vegan runners, just that publicity headline grabbing that you know the press seem to want. They don't seem they don't seem to want a just straightforward achievement running stories. They seem to want an angle on it. So I'll give them an angle. That's what I'm doing. So uh, I hope I can do that. But um, so it's, uh, yeah, that would be quite funny. I think. <laughs> yeah, through. Well, I'm just something to highlight. Um, I think it's that, you know, no, I didn't, because I was out, wasn't out that long. I mean, fully enough, when we were in Antarctica, because it was so, uh, we were there for so long, I don't think they knew what to do with us by the other like, fixtures of Antarctica, like snow people were going, they put these lectures on and things. And one woman did tell me that, well, actually, I was speaking to someone who was still out there, Richard Parks, he's trying to do a solo trek on skis to the South Pole. And he told me, when you're out there all day, doing things for a long time, you probably needed about 10,000 calories a day, which I found overwhelming because I know as a Tour de France rider, 7,000, it is a lot. When I actually got out there, I did think to myself, is it me just suddenly becoming like greedy or am I suddenly getting hungry? And unfortunately, they didn't have any food for me very much, but you do need a lot of calories, I think, if you're going to be there regularly on a daily basis. I was only out there for, I was just over four hours in Antarctica running, so it wasn't too bad for me. There were people out there for like nine and ten hours who we did impact on quite heavily. And when I did the uh, 100k with Tom, uh, I mean, that was brutalist though. I mean, I couldn't have walked that. I mean, how we was, he set off to do the 100k, he couldn't do it. So I'd been drafted in to go around with him on the last few laps. And I was getting so cold walking, I was finding it much more arduous than running, just to be trudging for hours and hours through Antarctica. You couldn't see anything. At one point, I think in the last couple of laps, it was like a, a box, and it just, the lid just opened, and all of a sudden you could see the mountains around you. So, but up until that point, it was like walking around with a load of fog and snow. No, I might as well have been in Africa trudging about. Um, but when we were doing that, I was out there for about 11 hours with Tom pushing him, carrying him, doing whatever I got, dragging him along. And then that was tiring and I did think, you know, this is, uh, you know, I could, uh, I could do it some simple things. <laughs> but there again, they'd only got chicken broth for people. So they've got all the flasks and everything ready for people to come in. But it's like, well, what do you want? Not water, you know? I mean, I don't, you know, there's something I could have. But um, it, didn't, it didn't really bother me because I wasn't there for doing it repetitively on a daily basis, but I can see that if you were, yeah, it would be an awful lot of soaking your energy. Because it is just keeping warm is difficult. But there would be insurance for you and your insurance for you the race actually do cover it. Um, they won't let you go unless I mean the, the North Pole one was a bit cavalier actually it was like, we all got hit, we have to go off the boat. We know it it's all happened a bit quick. We were in Long Yearburn and suddenly we were on a Russian plane with no windows, just flying. Well, we assumed it was flying and we were just going to, they weren't making noise outside and we were just going to get outside from the, uh, But um, we got a ride in the North Pole, they opened the door, the cold kind of was about minus 40. You were quickly shuttled across to these tents, the Russian tents. And um, we, I laid there for 
for about seven hours waiting for the next lot of competitors to come in. And um, after that, it was, I, I'm, I'm one of these people, I've still got this idea. A marathon will start between 8 and 10 in the morning, the spectators won't be in place. I'm thinking, well, hang on a minute, no, this is, there's no spectators here, it can start at any time. I mean, the setters are running at half past midnight. Um, and then we got a message to say the weather was closing in too badly and the Russians wanted us out because we'd be standing there, they were not geared up to keep us there. So we were there, probably I was at the North Pole for only about 36 hours. Um, and that was insured through the running company, the actual race. This one I did take out double insurance. But it, 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 it's kind of funny with the insurance. I mean, I spoke to a lot of the pilots and a lot of people doing expeditions. <coughs> and it is a question of, well, yeah, you're insured, but if anything goes wrong here, you can't be evacuated because no plane will fly in here. It cannot fly in here. We don't have a way of getting you out. So if you're going to be evacuated through medical grounds, um, you're just going to have to hope the weather in front of arenas is good enough for the plane to take off and the weather is good enough here for it to land because otherwise you're not getting out ever. You, you will have to wait here. Um, so insurance is a bit, um, you know, it's nice to have it kind of thing, but in the realistic terms, it doesn't really cover you. It doesn't actually cover you on flights either. If you get delayed in Antarctica and you've got a domestic flights knocking on, they won't take that into consideration. It's just you go to Antarctica, it's a risky place, don't go there if you don't, if you're expecting any kind of normal things because they just don't keep in place. So um, you go there and risk, sorry. Yeah. yeah. You're saying that the BBC tries to press yeah. I've changed my name to Viva, my surname to Viva by default. Have you thought I'd do that? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I know what you're saying. I do understand what you're saying. Yeah, I don't know. The results come up. It will yeah. come up with a certain Viva. Yeah, I, 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 I do understand what you're saying. I mean, it is that odd. I mean, I do understand what you're saying. I felt, I, I'm telling you, I was really, this is a bit too story. I was running up the mouth on my own, and Viva run a top on the float. I was in London Marathon one year, and the bird was screaming down his microphone, and here comes a vegan runner and another. And you know, for the publicity, I thought, yeah, this is going to be a moment. I got to the finish, it was completely dead. I could have come nine million in 20 hours, and I could have left. And I, I, I kind of jokingly, I wouldn't do this ever, obviously. I think the one thing I could have done then, when the cameras were on me, I should have whipped the top up, because that would have got me in the game. <laughs> Probably would have noticed more, but it would have. But you know what I mean? It does become that frustrating. They would have at least got the vegan. Who's that vegan word? And that's how frustrated I've been. Because I do not want publicity for Fiona Rhodes. I've, people have asked me, for, can we have a really nice picture of you running? The only problem is we can't use your name. I don't want my name in the I only want the vegan running it. To, I don't care who's wearing that just. It's to get that vegan word out there. And I know what you mean. It's just really difficult. So, yeah, I've not thought of it. I don't know what I'm talking well, but the other problem is then, if I, I've got to do it all again, it's the only vegan. I don't think I can do that. That's why we can do that. And they probably say, we didn't know it was you. We all wanted to do that. But, sorry. Yeah, yeah, we all wanted to do it. It must be family, sorry. Would it have been so difficult to get um, into the mainstream media? Have you thought about setting a YouTube channel? Or yeah, I mean, we've got our little, I mean, I, to be quite honest with you, if you want the honest 100% truth, anybody who's got any ideas on that, you know, vague. I'm not that brilliant with all this kind of stuff. Literally, I get up at half past three in the morning, I look after the animals and I do my training when I can. Yeah. Don't have time for anything else. He gets home in an evening about eight, um, and then he's sitting on the computer tapping away while I'm kind of just doing this thing, getting ready for bed. Um, we're not that au okay with the kind of things that I could do uh, to get publicity. Um, we've had a lot of promises, but it seems to me when I've done it, people are like, oh, loving it, we didn't think she was actually going to do it, we thought she was going to nutter. They did quite a nice thing on the ITV thing. Um, but I kind of, you know, um, yeah, I mean, any, any ideas like that, we don't really know where to turn to actually, uh, you know, do our self-promotion. We don't, we don't, we don't have a lot of time. I mean, people do forget Martin has got this full-time job. I mean, that was the main pressure of me getting home. I'd been delayed in Antarctica for a week. There were no, I mean, I was offered a flight out of Santiago, back to Paris on the 15th of December. And I knew that, I, I could hear when I rang him, I knew his work was playing up with him. He'd been off a long time, he'd taken all his holiday, he'd now got to take kind of extended annual leave. And people do forget that without his job, there is no sanctuary because all his money goes into those animals. And um, to have a job that's good enough to support the vast majority of care for that many animals 
is precious and it got to go back and they were making it very in fact if you want the truth my dad had to come down on the thursday sit in the drive look after the dogs do what he could while martin went to work for some of the day to give a presentation they would have been that sunny so the whole business of me getting home wasn't me going oh i'm tired i really need to come home. it was i've got to get home because if i don't get home that's it um, fortunately, I did manage to get home on Friday, on Friday night, but we, as I say, we don't get a lot of time for other things, it's all animals. And since this happened in August, it was a last minute decision to do this race, to do this set of races. Basically, somebody encouraged me to do it, but um, he was a Q80 banker who was loaded. He said, all right, you saying that, he said, oh, you do, you do it, you do it. I said, well, yes, but I'm not boarding. It was, it was literally, it came to the end of July, and it was a question of, uh, do I do it? Or do I not do it? Do I let a world record go or not? And then it was like, my mum and dad, uh, they're going to uh, kind of be mortgage their house, they're kind of going to get the money together to do it at the last minute. And since that, I've had no time. Um, it's been literally going to one race, getting home from one race, checking I've got everything ready to go to the next race. But it's not just me, it's the sanctuary. I've, I've got everything he needs, three animals, have I ordered everything, and they all right, the vet's been in, everything like that. So we just don't get very long. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, that's what, I really hope that, and as I say, everybody I've, I've met has said, uh, oh yeah, it's been great, but it's like, I can't seem to get it kind of all in one central point, so, you know, but it would be great if I could, but, you know, I'll just out loud. <laughs> Sorry. But, yeah, you mentioned, like, people um, not wanting to hear about the veganism. Yeah. Like Do you ever have the opposite when people, when you tell them you're vegan? Yeah. You're able to do what you do on a vegan diet, you have people respond yeah. to yeah, the, to be honest with you, the only country in the travels that uh, has been absolutely, absolutely overwhelmingly interested is in Russia. That's where they've been interested. They went mad for it over there. In fact, at the prize presentation at the end of this big race in Oz, there's this guy, he comes up on stage, he's giving all this blood, and oh, I'm going to be wonderful, and I'm thinking, oh, that's me, oh, you know, who is this? And I'm thinking, oh my god, he's talking about me. And he did, and I really want to, you know, I was like, I'm a bit embarrassed now. And he was like, oh, well, she's they didn't hide away from it. I mean, most people say, oh, we've got this brother from England, you know. They were like, you know, she's vegan and she's a strong woman. Because I, I walked away and this was Siberian. I'm thinking, oh, blimey, if you think you're strong in Siberia, I'm talking, no, you know, we can't talk, you know, wasn't it? Not exactly a hostile place to live. And that's where they really did eat it up. Now, whether it's because they don't get much of this kind of thing over there and it's kind of new to them, but they were the ones that they wanted to be at their press conference. Now, they feel embarrassed sitting next to kind of. Jeffrey Montambo from Kenya who run 207 in a marathon and he's sort of sitting there looking at me. And when he came to the press conference, it's any questions, open. it's not all directed at me, it's like, why am I here? I want me to win the race. But he said, you know, even he said that he wouldn't contemplate doing the amount of marathons I'd done and trying to run them in a decent time because I said to him I was going to America in a fortnight. And he was like, well, you know, Kenyans don't run over distance, they run 22 miles and, and that's it in training, they don't do it. But yeah, in Russia, yeah, they were great. Um, America, uh, um, and um, obviously in, in Morocco, I was in and out, I didn't, you know, but, but, but Russia's been a place that's really been interesting, yeah. Yeah, I, I, to be honest with you, I really don't know. I mean, I've got the sanctuary in Russia, and I've, I've got a bit of a name in Russia. People do know I've been very genuine and honest in, in what I've tried to do in Russia. In fact, it's very hard to get Russian people to accept any help at the start because they were dealing with a kind of suspicion and um, they weren't used to being helped on a kind of no strings basis. I just want to help you. Um, and I honestly don't know. I don't know if it's the custom. The marathon in Russia that I ran is the biggest race in Russia at 16,000 runners. And they want to get a new status of bronze, silver, and gold medal in the marathons. They're on bronze level now, and they want to build the profile of the race. And I think it helps races to say you've had, uh, I don't want to illustrious people in me, but you know, people come to the race and do it that are, you know, a bit high profile. I don't know why, but it really did go ballistic. I was all over the press. And they seem to really embrace the fact that I've come over there to do something and help somebody in Siberia. Even though I didn't know about the friend dog rescue before I went, but they contacted me whilst I was there. But they were really, really keen in the fact that I was coming to Russia, look, be able to do this place, the I'm really going. I really, and I've continued that with them, and they've asked me to be like a patron of their sanctuary. So I honestly don't know, or whether it was just genuine excitement in, that they loved their sport, <coughs> and they loved the fact that somebody had bothered to come to their race, um, and they, yes, I honestly don't know, but it was very genuine. 
and that's where the barometric most positive will list is there. Yeah. organise a camp in Antarctica. I mean, you can't go on what, what they provided in the mission camp in North Pole. It wasn't there long enough. It's not geared up for that. It's a research station. It's not geared up for visitors. We're looking to be able to go to the North Pole and do this place. In Antarctica, it became quite difficult because the race organiser who hates me at the North Pole Marathon uh, and Antarctica, um, he has a lot to do with the, the race. I mean, I, I've made it very clear he knew I was vegan. I was very reticent to make a big issue of the veganism because I just didn't want any more trouble. And if I said to you, the upset it caused me through Pugh Line, it put me in the coffin. I just didn't want anything more to do with it. It was upsetting me too much because I'm a very honest person and I only do what I do through a genuine belief. I'm not trying to, uh, I mean, I don't like these people who say they're raising money for a charity and then they'll take us, they'll basically, um, I'm raising money for a charity, I want to do this race. They take the first £10,000 they raise out of it to pay their entry fee and they just want a job and gone. Not like that, pay me own way. Um, I had told them I was vegan, but I did get it in the net from the actual camp. I said, you know, um, uh, she said, how's the food? And actually, I it's water porridge after three days, it's not very nice. And I said, you know, um, it's all right, yes, thank you very much. Our food here is renowned. I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm a vegan. She said, may I remind you, we are an expedition camp. We can't go on page from four or five guys. And I thought, well, it says on the form, you know. But, and I said, I didn't want to take it any further. I didn't want them going back and reporting to uh, the race organiser that the vegans have been fully again. So I kind of kept a low profile. But it wasn't easy for me. And also, they, the whole basis of these camps is so look what beautiful shoe bones we've cooked for this afternoon. And, uh, apparently, I have heard when people go into Antarctica, they say, uh, they don't talk about the race. They say, oh, the camp of food is something that's a bit funny. You don't have art and all you do is talk about food. But I can see that they do provide massive amounts of this, you know, you know, what everybody else would want, and very little of what I would want. And then of course when I raised the issue that they've got a, a meat stew and people were getting their label and taking it from the meat stew and putting it in the rice, and I raised the issue of kind of cross contamination. It's like, oh my god, she really is free. She's a troublemaker. So you know, I had to keep it, I really did have to keep it. Bear in mind, we're all living in this one tent. Um, and if you want to go back to the sleeping tent, at uh, one night it was minus 20 in the sleeping tent. The snow on the floor and a bottle of water was frozen next to your bed. And you just kind of got in your sleeping bag, oh, I'm here. You know, um, so it was, I didn't want to make too much of an issue. I didn't want to make my life any harder than it was already being made. Isn't it a shame, though, that you see it as a kind of diet? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Belief system. Well, I told her that. She was like, I said, look, I, I know you find it quite ridiculed, but you wouldn't ridicule someone, for instance, halal. So you wouldn't be allowed to do that. Uh, but it is, it's like, it's not a religion. So they know they can get away. You are just a fatty daddy through through blue. But I'll tell you something. I will have a pension saying this, but I'm going to be honest. Um, things were not stacked in that race for me to win it. I was trying to talk about it wasn't, I don't think the plan that I would win the race. And at halfway round, we had to run through the finish. And it's like, it's such delight to be, the, the shock on people's faces is even, little in first place. And I thought, oh, yeah. And then I thought, I'm going to win. I'm going to grow up and come to the grass to do it. And then I'll get the dog. But, you know, to be the person who was probably there to be in about 24 minutes and get all going with the top lane. Yeah, that's the way I actually look at it. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. 